Hello, everybody, and welcome to Spiritual Awakening 101. My name is Reverend Jerry Yaakov, and I'm your host. I'm also a student and teacher of uh, metaphysics. Some of my major paths that I've studied and practiced and journeyed on are A Course in Miracles, 12-step recovery work, science of mind, and um, a variety of Buddhist readings and uh, Zen readings and Tao readings. Uh, just to mention a few. Self-help books, yeah, I've kind of done my share as well, as many of you have, I'm sure. Well, today I'm going to take uh, an opportunity to offer you a uh, free copy of my booklet, and it's called A Course in Miracles Journey Through the Twelve Steps. And later there'll be a um, uh, an address and a phone number if you want to call and get your free copy. Uh, it'll cover a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. It's free, there's no obligation, and uh, for those of you that are interested, uh, fine, you can follow up with it. I hope you find it interesting reading. Well, the first thing I want to say uh, really is that this is not a religious program. Uh, religious programming, I'm sure, has its place. And ministers and um, clerics and men and women of the cloth in a variety of religions have a place in our culture, in our society, and in our world. I would never uh, doubt that or uh, say that it was not appropriate. But I am not a religionist. Uh, I am a spiritual person, and I follow spiritual wisdom, which at times intersects with religion, and at other times it may, in your estimation or mine, um, vary from the religious dogma and practices and rituals. But basically my understanding of the difference would be that a spiritual walk and a spiritual practice is one between the practitioner and God itself of your understanding. There are no intercessors. There is no intermediary. There's no uh, minister or teacher or guru uh, necessarily that um, speaks for you or with you or through you, you are in direct contact with the heaven of God within you. And that is the message of Jesus, the master teacher. He said that the kingdom of heaven is within you and uh, all you need is your belief. Your belief will set you free because it's the truth. If you have a direct experience of the God of your understanding, of a loving, precious, um, perfect God, perfectly uh, all intelligent, all present, all powerful, um, then this is a spiritual path. Now you can concurrently uh, practice religion with that as well. If you like the ritual, if you like the readings, if you like uh, some of the, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, the bells and whistles that go along with it. Uh, again, th that's always our uh, choice, and I'm in no way <clears throat> minimizing or in any way uh, criticizing. No, okay, so the difference between religion and spirituality, that out of the way, this is a spiritual program right here. This is a, uh, a video about spirituality and metaphysics, new thought. Okay, uh, the first thing I want to talk about after that distinction is when do people generally move into a mode of spirituality? I think it's important that we recognize our tolerance for pain. Being in the world, there are so many challenges, so many uh, ways in which one's mind, one's psyche, one's body even uh, can be threatened if you will. Uh, the world is uh, an interesting place. It can be a classroom. It can be a place where we learn and we get closer to our higher power. 
But if taken on its face alone, without the spiritual element, the world is a cold and lonely place based on a thought of attack and ego. That's the teaching that I come from. The ego does project images into a world that seems separate from both God and ourselves, and they appear threatening. They appear uh, to not have our best interests at heart. One of the nicest sayings that I came uh, into contact with at the beginning of my spiritual walk was, trust the process. And I had to really learn to do that because I didn't trust the process. <clears throat> I equated the process with the world. And I had long since earlier become very suspicious and cynical. And I didn't trust the world. And now I was being asked in a metaphysical, spiritual realm to trust the process, to trust the God of my understanding for healing and guidance. And to this day, uh, my resistance comes up to the trust. However, in my heart, I know that it's true. The universe is a loving, trusting place, trustworthy place. Why? Because anything that's of God directly and the kingdom of heaven is within our hearts. That I can trust. Somebody outside of myself, that's another story entirely. And what they may be calling for is my compassion, my forgiveness, my loving kindness. But my trust in them to be my higher power, that doesn't make any sense. Nobody outside of me on a separate plane of existence or a separate ideation of ego can in any way, no matter how smart they are, how learned they are, they, they aren't my higher power. I trust the process within. I trust my intuition. I trust that radar that we all have of spirituality. Well, okay, um, so I mentioned our tolerance to pain. Although the tolerance to pain is great, I believe that it does hit a, a breaking point where we say, I'm sick and tired of this pain and I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and there must be another way. When we acknowledge that there is another way and we open to that wisdom, we then look within. There's some um, inner mechanism, an instinctual mechanism, a gravitational pull to use, you know, a, a term of physics, gravity, that pulls us towards our higher power, which is within our minds and our hearts, and we no longer look outside of ourselves to false idols. Uh, false idols, as I've talked about many times, can include people, places, and things. Look for yourself at your own inventory. What have you been bowing down to and thinking that it will save you, give you peace and harmony and serenity? You'll find that it just isn't possible and it's not true. Excuse me, I'm going to cut this off. So I apologize for the interruption. So we recognize that we are to trust the process and that the, tr the process is trustworthy. And we recognize that there's a gravitational pull within each of us, an inherency, if you will, of spiritual oneness to our higher power, our creator. And that is the truth. And whether it's in this lifetime or a subsequent lifetime or a previous lifetime, we will at some point be pulled towards that light, the light, the life, and the way. Well, a little bit of my own story, uh, at least as I remember it in this lifetime, uh, I was an only child, born to uh, lower middle class parents. We always suffered and struggled financially. And that became uh, one of the lenses that I looked through uh, in growing up and then becoming an adult. For me, money was scarce. And I even remember my parents saying to me, rich people had to sacrifice so much, especially their health, to achieve their wealth. And uh, I really believe that if one became wealthy, you had to sacrifice your health. Long hours, stress, uh, probably a lot of the ambition and backstabbing that I already saw in school. Uh, but I was drawn to that because without an alternative, what else is there but the world's uh, attractions and the false idols? 
So for me, money became important. Stature became important and I became a professional. Went to graduate school and got a professional degree and a license uh, to practice my profession. And what I found was that I was miserable. You've heard this story and I'm not going to bore you with my details because details really don't mean anything if they're egoic. They're false. But there were egoic, uh, there was an egoic storyline. And the storyline for me was I got to the point where the drug usage and the money um, struggle and uh, the positionality for uh, other people's admiration, uh, you know, became too much on my psyche and on my spiritual um, oneness with God. It, it came to the breaking point where I needed another way, a better way. My parents, I'm not going to blame. Uh, they, God bless them, did not have a spiritual life. So they didn't exemplify that for me. My mother suffered from uh, what I would consider great uh, disabilities in her mental health and psychology because she didn't have the peace and serenity of God. And so what happens is that we project onto our loved ones uh, unnecessary protection unnecessary smothering, unnecessary fears out of the name of love because I love you so much. I'm so concerned about you. Don't do this. Don't go there. Don't hang out with these people. Let me do this for you. Uh, you're too young. I'll take care of it. So not letting a youngster such as myself grow into adult responsibility in a healthy, functional way but rather in a toxic, dysfunctional way, uh, I became a dysfunctional adult. And that seeped into my relationships with uh, people. It seeped into my relationships <clears throat> with my profession and with my health. Early on, I began to suffer from hypertension and uh, phobic fears. So it was both mental and physical and uh, very difficult. Overweight, that was an issue at times. I would yo-yo on my weight. All these are symptomatic of an underlying issue. And that, I believe, is always an unfit spiritual condition. When it's becoming fit, when one has a practice, and one has a, a way of relying on a power greater than themselves that's love, you can certainly begin to trust the process. And you can start to undo all of the false beliefs and all of the uh, programming that was so toxic and difficult, uh, I began to let go of some of it, some of the false idols. I recognized that living simply, having all my needs met certainly is, is okay. We all need our needs met while we're uh, in this world that we were in but not of. But I don't need lavish, uh, something lavish or a rich you know, lifestyle of the rich and famous. Uh, which is being sold to us constantly through television, movies, and commercials. What I realized is that there's a simplicity in the way of the Buddha. There's a simplicity in the way of the, the Jesus Christ. There's a way in the simplicity of the Tao and uh, all of the yogis and uh, really holy men and women were teaching that when you look within, you were provided with manna from heaven because the kingdom of, of heaven is within. And you don't have to chase with fear uh, for all the things outside to fill that God space. That God space gets filled very organically, very naturally when one's mind turns within and prays and meditates. And so that's what I started to do. And I began to, you know, become restored to sanity, which is a big part of the 12-step recovery programs. You recognize, first of all, that you've been in denial about the truth. And you say, fine, I recognize my life doesn't work. Now what I'm going to do is turn to a higher power of my own understanding, and you'll be guided, whether it's the group, whether it's nature, whether it's some um, abstract idea of love, of Christ, of Buddha, 
there's so many opportunities to find what resonates for you. And in my case, it was the Christ. I found A Course in Miracles, and that became my uh, book of wisdom and higher power. I also attended numerous, numerous fellowships of recovery in 12-step. And the recovery and the fellowship and the sponsorship and the literature also helped me to be restored to sanity through the wisdom of my higher power. So all of this uh, then led me to the next step. And that's to begin to identify my own inventory. What is it that I have built up within my own mind that's keeping me from harmony and alignment with my higher power? That's keeping me from really knowing that the truth will set me free and that love, perfect love, casts out all fear. I wanted that so desperately. I wanted it. Maybe desperate isn't the right word because when you get into uh, a spiritual way of thinking and a spirituality of your own choosing, you're not desperate anymore. There's a, there's a, uh, a knowing. There's a knowing that you're on the right path. And uh, very soon I found uh, I, I had moments of calmness, of clarity, of real lucid thinking. Uh, I was lucid in a way that I'd never been before. Sure, the baggage was still there. I was unpacking all of that baggage. And that's where the inventorying keeps coming in. Doing a large inventory with your sponsor or with your mentor and with God, of course, where you identify some of the ambitions, some of your fears, some of the guilt that you carry, some of the regrets, uh, some of the envy, some of the uh, thoughts that you're not good enough, low self-esteem, uh, less than worthwhileness. All of these things started to come up for me to look at and then give to my higher power and humbly ask that God remove it. I certainly couldn't because I had dreamt them up. I had manufactured them. I had nurtured and, and um, really uh, instilled them in my mind so deeply and so invested that I needed that higher power to reassure me that I was worthwhile, that all of the things that I felt so guilty about and things that I didn't even know I was guilty about, it was a free-floating anxiety. All of that became clearer and clearer as baseless, as not as God created me. And I was turning around more and more towards the uh, individual and the soul that God created me as, rather than the artificiality of that ego that I had um, made of myself and had replicated through my family of origin. So these are all, you know, ways to uh, become on the road less traveled. I love that expression, uh, Scott Peck's book and, uh, and Scott Peck's uh, you know, a uh, whole explanation. You know, there were two paths in the, in the forest and I uh, took the one ro road less traveled. Well, that means the one where we look within to our minds rather than look outside for all of our nurturement. People, places, and things I knew could no longer uh, be the answer for me and fill that God space. God was within me and certainly already filled the space if I would awaken to it. One of the big uh, ways to do that was through love, forgiveness, and loving kindness. Practicing as the Buddhists call it, metta, M-E-T-T-A. Uh, and as Christ said, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. These were all aspects of my recovery and my practical walk on the road less traveled. Uh, God presents everything it's brought up for me to look at with my higher power now, rather than alone with my ego thinking. Ego, uh, edging God out is the acronym I like, means I'm alone looking at things. And I'm coming to conclusions that I think are best for me, but that means that it excludes other people. It judges and is critical of other people. The Tao is famous for, you know, a very simple ideal, simple idea of no blame. The Tao practice is no blame. The ego practice is forever blaming, 
forever scapegoating, forever not being responsible and putting responsibility on others. So again, all of these uh, readings and uh, philosophies and theologies and New Thought Movement and the Course in Miracles, uh, they all brought me to a place where I was further and further along on the road less traveled, which is recovery, which is a remembering of who and what I am. And I am as God created me. I am that innocent inner child that I care to take care of when I forget. That inner child needs me. That inner child is the Christ child, is the babe, is the sheep, is the, is the, uh, the child in the manger, is the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. That's the inner child. The inner child is lovable, loving, and loved completely, and one and inseparable from God itself, the creator. Well, you go through these steps, as I call them, or phases. Uh, you start out in recovery or in uh, spiritual practice hurting very deeply. And that's when you come out of uh, denial because you're hurting so, so, so much. And you say, there must be another way. So the hurting phase. And then you get into the healing phase, which I've been describing with some detail, uh, my own walk uh, on the road less traveled through 12-step recovery, through A Course in Miracles. And again, I'm going to remind you, there's this Course in Miracles uh, journey through the 12-step booklet that I have offered for you for free. Uh, this is the healing. So we go from hurting to healing. And then uh, we go to the helping. So these phases overlap and there are regressions and we go back to hurting. Then we get back into our healing phase and then we get back into our helping. Uh, and helping is service. Helping is doing something like what I'm doing uh, with my ministry. I've been to prisons and, and taken what I consider uh, the love of God into the prison system with me. And I have friends to this day whom I met and uh, I fostered the relationships from those ministry days in the prisons. Uh, you know, I've worked with adolescents. I've worked with seniors. Uh, I've worked in alcohol and drug treatment centers. Uh, there's been all kinds of opportunities for me as well as practicing uh, the principles of recovery and of awakening spiritually in my own family, with my wife, with my children, with my grandchildren, with colleagues that I have worked with, former colleagues, current people that I work and associate with. Everything is a classroom where the relationships may become challenging and I'm tempted to judge people and to abdicate my responsibility in the matter and blame them. And what you find, of course, is that the, the way that I'm practicing and the principles that I've learned help me to uh, build bridges between people, build bridges between me and my higher power. Uh, clean the slate, walk in, in fresher air. All of this leads to peace and serenity. There's a, um, a message that you begin to carry, both verbally, uh, but primarily by example. Uh, it's, it's a living uh, expression of the truth. Why? Because it's coming from within. I'm trusting the process. And I find myself behaving and speaking uh, and living differently, less selfishly, more worthy of uh, your friendship because I'm a friend to you. And friendship uh, is, is a wonderful thing. You can make friends with the world and everyone in it, whether you know them and will ever meet them or not. Because the truth is that everything exists in our minds anyway, and then is projected out into the uh, perceptual field as in a loving expression or as a fearful expression from the ego. 
which road will I take? And more and more consistently, I take the road less traveled, but it's the loving road. Well, this is the uh, basis really for the, the whole video that I wanted to make today. Uh, you know, just explaining my, my travels, my practice, encouraging other people, uh, sharing this book with you. If you're interested and you contact us by phone or email, uh, today's reading in one of the daily readers in one of the 12-step programs uh, is a wonderful way to close, I think, and that's uh, concerning service. It says, in our early recovery, we, we may have been skeptical, confused, angry, or sad. Certainly, no one has come uh, to the program with things working well. A physical, mental, and spiritual bottom usually brings us to recovery. Well, we talked about that, hitting bottom, uh, being sick and tired, asking for a better way. Well, when we come to our recovery meetings a few times, we may have caught a glimmer of hope that recovery may help us. After a while, we've asked someone for their phone number or have a cup of coffee with them to see if we might become fellow travelers. And that relationship is so important. As we reflect on those early days, we can only imagine what might have become of us had we not found recovery and the meetings. Our thoughts may turn to those whose lives are similarly affected, and we'd like for them to have the same opportunity for spiritual growth. So we decide to participate in the group's business meetings. Here we get into the helping, hurting, and then uh, healing, and then helping, and accept a service role and so on and so forth. And then it closes, it says, on this day, I recall my early days and the program I have made and the progress that I have made. In return, I will perform service in some way so that my program may find uh, this life-saving uh, offering to others in service and in God's name, not my own. We carry the message. We practice these principles in all our affairs. Well, again, I've been very grateful to uh, share this with you in this episode. Uh, if you have any questions, you can certainly contact me through the uh, phone number or the, uh, the email as well. Uh, I want to thank the NECAT Network. I always thank them for putting this show on. Uh, you'll find us on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, I'm trying to get the message out, uh, coming out of my shell and being in the helping phase as much as I can, along with my current healing uh, and less and less of the hurting. So again, thank you so much for joining us as we always close with Namaste, Shalom, and Peace. And we'll see you next time. God bless.